take two. Oh, he's God. And God don't ever change. God in the middle of the sea, by the help of the great creator, true and better God to me, he's God. God don't ever change, oh, always with be God, God in creation, God when I don't fail, God way up in heaven. He's God. God don't ever change. Oh, always with God. Spoke to the mountain, said I forget I am. What you get up this morning? Skip around like a lamb. He's God. God don't ever change. Oh, always with me, God. God in the time of sickness. God in the doctor too. In the time of the influenza. Truly, better God to you. He's God. God don't ever change. Oh. With me, God, God in the pulpit, God way down at the door, He's God in the evening corner, God on the floor, He's God. God don't ever change, oh, mm -hmm. always with me. We have four Gospels because they all tell a different story. They're all unique. They're all diverse. They all have different stories that present Jesus in different ways so that we as the um, reader and as the listener can encounter God in different stories. Okay, first of all, four is the Hebrew number for uh, universal, uh, north, south, east, west. Uh, what the Jews referred to as the four corners of the earth, which is a symbol for the, the whole earth. And so there are four Gospels, and each Gospel uh, has a unique authorship, a unique background, and a unique audience. People say, well, the Bible is written by men. Okay, yes. So is every book on the planet. But the difference is, the Bible is the only one that has, been, has survived the test of time. Each one of them have a different testimony. Each one of them have a different aspect of what part of the life and teachings of Jesus that they're focusing on. And so we have this beautiful harmony and yet variety in four different Gospels, instead of there just being one. God knows what he's doing. He inspired them to write these, and he, he's kept the, the Bible all these years and preserved it for us today. But at that time, the audience, uh, some were talking to the Jews specifically, some were trying to reach the Gentiles, and that's, that's why it's important. You know, having four Gospels gives a more complete picture of who Jesus is, more complete picture of Christ, but it also uh, enables us to objectively um, verify the proof of the accounts that they write about. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, the 
uh, the Jewish law in the courts is there has to be at least two or three witnesses. And so when you have two or three, or in this case four, uh, different accounts, um, it, it just verifies what they're saying. Well, the gospel writers recorded from their perspective what they saw. And by the way, they weren't the only ones. It wasn't just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there were lots of people who were writing the things that they had seen. In fact, we know that there's source material about the sayings of Jesus that are not even in the four Gospels. For example, Paul says in, in his letter to the Corinthians that it's more, as the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, that's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It was a diversity. Two people right there with Jesus the whole time wrote different accounts, and the other two uh, wrote there sometime later and uh, had to uh, find people to tell the stories and get it written down. And sometimes it leaves a, a few inconsistencies, you know, but it's still no contradictions because God's word is it. Well, the, they must have led fascinating lives. And we think of Mark as, as being the first gospel that was completed. And in my view, they were all written before AD 70, before the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. And we, we have these prophecies in what we call the Olivet Discourse. So the three synoptic gospels, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, we have what's called the Olivet Discourse, where you have prophecies of what is about to unfold with the destruction of Jerusalem. So if they had been written after 70, then they would not be prophecies. And so Jesus told them what was going to happen in their lifetimes with the destruction of the, uh, of the temple. The linguistic style is very different. Um, like Luke is really complex. Uh, John's very simple, even though it has probably the most complicated um, you know, concepts in it. I, I love how Matthew and Mark uh, are kind of like two sides of a coin. They have so many of the same exact stories and everything, but you'll, you'll catch little nuances that one has that the other doesn't have. And um, so, yeah, and then three of them, are, they're called synoptic gospels because they're, it's, it, synoptic means like through the same lens. There were a lot of things that were written down, but these four were preserved and ultimately canonized uh, by the church because they gave an accurate representation following a threefold criteria. Number one, antiquity. These were things that had been believed by Christians from the earliest times. Number two, apostolicity. So it was written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle. And number three, universality. It was something that was not just believed within a part of Christianity or Christendom, but throughout the broader uh, Christian movement. So using that threefold criteria, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as our four canonical gospels. The Bible says that Without faith, it's impossible to please God, uh, but he who comes to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who diligently seek him. And so when you look and examine four, all four of the Gospels, you get rewarded uh, by comparing and contrasting the stories. We have these four different guys giving us four very different accounts of Jesus, yet all being true, all being woven together. If you have, uh, you have a scene or a crime and you have witnesses, if they all say the exact same thing verbatim, then you know it's made up because they've been coached. If they say the same thing only in their own verbiage and it, there's differences the way they come and see things, like for instance, you know, Luke was a physician, Matthew was a tax collector, and then you had fishermen, and they all saw the same events, some would emphasize on certain things of Christ. Some, it, they would emphasize on something else, but they were all saying the same thing. This, in modern evidence, shows legitimacy. It shows proof that they were telling the truth. So I think all four were written before AD 70, and they, we see evidence of them being circulated very early in Christianity. One of our early church fathers, uh, Irenaeus and then Papias, they, they both write about early copies of the Gospels in Aramaic and Hebrew. So we often think of New Testament manuscripts in Greek, but they weren't thought in Greek. They weren't written originally in Greek. They weren't even spoken in Greek. They were in Aramaic, which was Jesus' dominant language. But they're very quickly translated into Greek so that a broader audience, the entire Mediterranean world, would be able to hear the Gospel message. 
So it's a fascinating process to see the formation of the canon. For example, at the end of Colossians, uh, where Paul was in prison at that point, you see that with him there are Mark and Luke both in that cell. And so you can see the, the Gospels coming into their final form. You can see Paul's letters also coming into their final form at that time. And it is across Across all four Gospels, you're getting the Jesus story. Here is a king, and he is the king of a heavenly realm, and we're learning how to live as citizens in this realm under this king. And you're hearing the stories, but it is exciting to hear each and every one. You don't want to miss out on one of these Gospels. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word Tell me the story most precious Sweetest that ever was heard Tell how the angels in chorus Sang as they welcomed his birth Matthew was a, a former tax collector and a Jew and being that he was a he was looked down upon by both the Jews for being a Roman tax collector and from the Romans for being a Jew. So he was kind of outcast from both. And his main audience that he was writing to was the, was the Jews. And he was writing to show the king of the Jews, Jesus as the king of the Jews. He was a tax collector. He was a Jew living in Jerusalem. He was collecting taxes for Rome, the enemy, and giving it, or taking it from the Jewish people and giving it back to Rome. And whatever he took extra was his pay. Rome didn't care how much he took. As long as he paid what was due, they were happy. And then he made his living and Rome was happy, he was happy. But if you remember, Matthew was convicted when Jesus came by. Oh, Matthew, the tax collector, and someone that was not a Christian. One day, he's, one day he's a tax collector and wealthy and rich, and the next day Jesus comes to him and says, come and follow me. What Matthew does is he lays it all down and he follows Jesus Christ. He becomes one of his disciples. Think about in Genesis how um, the earth was given to Adam. He was given to man, um, the heavens belong to the Lord and the earth has given to man, the, Satan took um, and used dominion that man had yielded and because it was man, God had to come legally, had to enter back into the world system through man and then of course through Jesus Christ and so Matthew had to give for, in my opinion, a legal account of the genealogy to legally make it possible for Jesus to do what Jesus did in the fulfillment of his beating, his death, and his resurrection. So when you think about the four different gospels that we have, there's a lot of similarities and differences, but let's talk about the differences. We have four different authors, each coming from a different standpoint. So let's take Matthew. Matthew, who is one of the disciples of Jesus, was a tax collector. So that means he's a Jew, but it also means he's a hated Jew. Here's a guy that Jesus chose who in his culture would have been greatly looked down upon because of what they would consider a violation of his Jewishness. Essentially, he was a traitor for the Roman government to collect taxes. And yet here was a guy who Jesus chose to bring into the fold. Now you can imagine that kind of guy, how would he talk about Jesus? Well, he's going to come at it from a very Jewish perspective. So he's really emphasizing the Messiahness of Jesus, but also as a guy who shows grace and uh, chose this guy who was lowly. And you see that thread a lot. So if we're talking about Matthew, Matthew means gift of Yahweh. Without Matthew, we miss out on the gift from Yahweh. He is, his gospel is telling about Jesus to the Jewish people. He's talking about a king of a kingdom and how to live as a citizen in the kingdom realm. And he's taking, it's the most beautiful bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament 
to the future of where we're going. And it's almost like his, his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew is the Torah. It's the final Torah. Taxes were a huge issue, and we even have among the 12, we have a zealot, Simon the Zealot, who was a political activist against the Roman taxes. So even within the 12, you have a, a former tax collector and a former zealot. So they would have, you know, in on the streets outside of, outside of that, before being called into Jesus, they would have been on opposite sides of everything. So Matthew was, was very unique in his call, and it, it goes to show that it doesn't matter what you have done before. It matters what Jesus calls you to do and that you listen to what he calls you to be doing. His name originally was Levi, but he goes by Matthew. And tax collectors, just like today, are not real popular. You don't want to have visits with the IRS. Uh, but he portrays Jesus as our King and Messiah, or the King of the Jews and the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, remember Matthew's other name was Levi, or Levi in Hebrew, and it means uh, attached. He was a priest, and so he would know the symbolism of the priesthood as along with all you know, the, the writings of the Mishnah and the Gemara. Uh, so Matthew was quite a scholar. Culmination of, of, of the prophecies and uh, this, he was trying to reach his own people um, who had rejected Christ. Well, each writer had an audience in mind. We don't know for sure. All we can do is surmise because Matthew 1, 1 doesn't say, you know, this is the story of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, to the Jewish believers who are among us. But we, we surmise that he was targeting a Jewish audience who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. So these were what we might today refer to as Messianic believers in, in Yeshua. And all the early followers essentially were uh, that. We believe that because he's constantly quoting scripture. So he's taking the Old Testament scriptures. Just look at the nativity narratives. You've got six different Old Testament sources that are cited in the nativity narratives. Thus was fulfilled what Hosea said. Thus was fulfilled what Jeremiah said or Isaiah said. So Matthew's very clearly showing this Jewish audience that Jesus is the fulfillment of these messianic prophecies. And the things that he, that he says in his gospel, there's so many different quotations directly uh, culled from the Old Testament, as well as, um, you know, there, there's also some allusions to the Old Testament. And he, he, he points, like he's where we, we see Isaiah chapter 7, where it says, you know, and, and the virgin shall be with child. Um, and, you know, and, and so he, he grabs that out of Isaiah and he says, see, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. You know, I love the book of Matthew because it gives us a really, really clear picture about the shepherds and how they worshiped Jesus whenever he was born. The shepherds were out in the field. Shepherds were really, really dirty, nasty workers. And, and believe it or not, no one really wanted to be around the shepherds because they just, they, they, they smelled bad and they, they just didn't have a really great reputation about what they did. But so here are the shepherds and they're out in the field and the angel appears before them and tells them that Jesus uh, is, is going to be born or that Jesus has been born. And so the shepherds, Unlike a lot of us today, they go, they, they put down what they're doing and they go to see this Jesus, the Savior of the world. And they worship Him. They worship Him with all their heart and all their soul. And then what they did after they saw baby Jesus, they saw our Savior in the manger, they go back to what they're doing. They go back into the fields, but everyone that they see, they tell the salvation message that Jesus was born. The Savior of the world has been born in a manger. You know, Matthew speaks of uh, uh, the Magi, uh, the, the high level, the high caste people coming from Persia to worship Jesus a few months after his birth. Matthew has the story of the wise men. It's the only one. And we find out that what they're inquiring about uh, is where Jesus is. And the Bible tells us they found him in a house in Bethlehem. So apparently Joseph and Mary 
had stayed in Bethlehem after the birth. Right now, you go home and set up your nativity scene. You'll have shepherds, <laughs> you'll have wise men, and you'll have a star. And two of those things are out of place because the shepherds were told by angels and they went. And the wise men followed a star, but they weren't there the night the Lord was born. <laughs> the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born go. well Matthew cites the Old Testament literature more than any of the other writers do and so as I mentioned in the nativity narrative there's six different places where he's citing scripture and he doesn't stop he's just getting warmed up at that point um, where he, for example, is talking about Isaiah, the virgin birth, and then Jesus being a Nazarene. And so he's documenting his case using what we call the Old Testament or what they would call the Hebrew Bible. Like, for instance, Matthew has um, 12 parables in it, and nine are unique to that gospel. So if we didn't have Matthew, we would miss out on the gospels and the, I mean, on the parables and the stories that Matthew presents. It's amazing that the moment that Jesus invited him, he left everything behind, just like the fishermen had done. He left everything behind and joined up with him. And of course, you know, that's the biggest part about Matthew that we know. And, uh, he is the one, uh, even though Luke has a shorter version of it, he's the one to very detail the temptation, also the Sermon on the Mount. Three chapters, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Right now, if people was to put that in practice, it would be Im amazing. You know, like Mahatma Gandhi told, told someone that if the English had lived by that Bible they brought over to India, the entire continent, the entire country of India would be Christian today. And then you go to Matthew, the third level, of Jewish interpretation uh, would be called uh, midrash or drosh. Uh, midrash means to uh, search or seek or to search out, and it means to thresh grain and look through the grain for the kernel you want, and that's what Matthew does. Uh, Matthew's interpretation of Jesus' life is different from the others. He can use both levels of Mark and Luke, but he is on a, a different level, a higher level. Matthew is the place where we have some, some teaching that's unique. Um, that horrifying story of the sheep and the goats uh, is Matthew 25. Matthew 18 has a lot of stuff in it. It's where we learn about church discipline. Um, it's where we learn that if we don't forgive, God doesn't forgive us in the same way. Uh, this is something for me that, uh, that I love about Matthew, and that's uh, Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission. Um, it, although you have it in, in Mark a little bit different, uh, Jesus uh, uh, gives his kind of his final message uh, before his ascension in Matthew as written, and it's um, to me that Great Commission is just uh, inspiring, you know, how, how, how Matthew pins it there for us in Matthew 28. Matthew's book also, you know, goes to uh, 28 chapters, so it's, per, it's really detailed. But he, he gathers Jesus' teachings into uh, a set of five, and I think that's to connect with the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. Uh, that he puts his, he, he has action and teaching, action and teaching five times in the Gospel of Matthew. And so he sets it up according to the law of Moses. And so the whole Gospel of Matthew is a presentation of the kingdom and the Jew refusing the kingdom. And you can go to Matthew 7, Matthew 8, uh, Matthew 21, Matthew 21 down in verse 35. Jesus, it's all there that they refused the kingdom. And Jesus said, because of this, the kingdom will be taken away from them and given to a nation that will bear the fruit thereof, which is the body of Christ, the church. And so
So his point is to prove to Jews, and he has exactly 50 direct quotations of the Old Testament to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. The number 50, by the way, is the number of the Holy Spirit. If you remember uh, Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on the church, was 50 days after Passover. And so uh, Matthew chose 50 quotes to prove his point. Matthew tells two miracles that are not written in any of the other gospels. And it's the story of the healing of the two blind men and the fish that had a coin in his mouth. You know, without these stories, you miss out on certain miracles that Jesus is your provider. He's your king. He walks where we haven't walked before and we can move into this realm because we are created in his image to be like him. And if we read these stories and we can see ourselves, okay, he was the provider. He provided a coin in a fish's mouth. He's going to provide for me too, because he's no respecter of a person. What he does for one, he would do for the other. And so if we can grasp our authority and who we are in Christ, then we can believe these miracles, walk in these miracles as a citizen under this king. And then you see the miracles and signs and wonders walk out in your world because that's what you're called to do. We hung the winner on a cross. We hung the winner on a cross. We got a winner on the cross. So let me hear you say Jesus. Um, there is absolutely no birth narrative. Um, he just jumps right into the action. And uh, in fact, I, I think it starts out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Like that's the first verse of Mark. And I preached through that a while back and, and was just like, you know, man, they use the word immediately a lot in Mark. It's very action oriented. It's all about action. The main, the key word in, in Mark is the word immediately. It's very action-oriented. It's the immediately this, immediately that. Then we did this. Mark recorded a little bit about the preaching of John the Baptist, but he immediately after that goes into several miracle healings that the Lord uh, performed. In the book of Mark, we have the author being John Mark, who was a... Uh, early disciple who traveled and we find him in the books of book of acts uh, not ever having met jesus but spent time with paul and missionary journeys and most likely his testimony in the book of mark is the testimony of peter so essentially we have peter's testimony and the book of mark is very peter peter says in first peter 5 13 he's talking about john mark as his son so he was younger, that he would follow Peter, and they call him Peter's son. And incidentally, Mark is uh, John Mark, who we read much more about in the book of Acts. He's from an old established Jerusalem family, and his uncle is Barnabas, who's one of the early apostles and Paul's companion on his first missionary journey. So Barnabas' household was used in the early Christian movement. So, I mean, he grew up, uh, you talk about it, the, the consummate eyewitness, that was Mark. I remembered a pastor friend of mine, actually the one who rebaptized me when I was uh, 28 years old. He, tell, he would suggest to young people who wanted to start on the Bible to start with the book of Mark because of, it was short, but it had everything you need in there to learn about salvation and so forth. It's not in any really chronological order. You can just imagine Peter's excitement of like, oh yeah, this one time this happened and this one time this happened. But what you have is a very gospel-centered book, a, a book that is very punchy and action-oriented and is about the, the salvation, the, the work that Jesus Christ is bringing. So we believe that Mark was written between 50 AD and 55 AD. This is a gospel of miracles. There's 21 miracles written in Mark, in the gospel of Mark. And these are the demoniac, 
uh, where Jesus goes across the sea and frees a man full of demons. These are um, miracles and signs and wonders. And Mark's telling these stories because he's like, you've got to know this king. You've got to walk in this holy um, presence of the king so that you can see how how he moved on this earth, how Jesus moved on this earth. The Greek word euthus occurs again and again because it's a lot about action. And of course, Peter's sermons were to the Romans in Rome. And so what they were interested in was action and power. And so Mark writes about Jesus' power and Jesus' action, all the things that he did, the miracles and so on. Mark's the shortest gospel and uh, Mark is the oldest gospel. So therein, from just doing a good historiography, which is how we create history, we'd have to say Mark is extremely important because he's our, our oldest primary source. There's the story of uh, Jesus making the disciples get into the boat after he fed the 5,000, and he sends them to the other side by themselves. Well, in the Gospel of Mark, you examine the same story, and you realize this is just after Jesus uh, had sent those same disciples out and gave them authority over demons and healing people. And they came back a little puffed up and they were a little bit arrogant saying, hey, Jesus, we're pretty good at this. And, uh, and Jesus knew they needed to be humbled a little bit. And so that's why he sent them out by themselves. And they realized, wow, we can't handle a storm at sea. So Jesus walks on the water and he, uh, he comes to them and they realize that apart from Jesus, you know what, we can't do it. Apart from his authority and what he's given us, uh, we, we're not all that. <laughs> There's very little teaching in Mark. I think there are four parables, and each one is about seeds and gardening, uh, standard things that anybody could understand. So Mark's the simplest of all the gospels. Mark, my foundational teaching, when I learned the parable that Jesus taught in Mark 4, the parable of the sower and the seed. And Jesus said, it is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom. The sower sows the word. And he made it very clear that if one did not understand the parable, this particular parable, you wouldn't understand anything that Jesus taught. And when you think about Mark 4, and then you go read Matthew's account of it, it's a process of us sowing the word. Jesus is the word, and Jesus is his words or spirit in their life. When, when you understand the process in the natural of sowing the word in your heart, not in your mind, in your heart, and he goes through the process of the condition of a man's heart, and when you begin to sow the word that's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, it begins to transform you from the inside out. Mark has the parable of the sower of the seeds. And it says in Mark that if you understand this parable, you will understand all of the kingdom realm. And the parable is talking about the sowing of the seed. So you could take the sowing of the word. When you study the word, it's like a seed that goes into our heart. There's different levels of of your heart soil. But as you read the word and as you sow seeds, of the word into your heart and you continue to sow and continue to sow, it says just like we see in farming, it's seed, time, and harvest, those seeds that you sow, which is the word, if I'm sowing, uh, let's say Galatians 2.20, I just want to give you a quick example. If I'm sowing Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified in Christ and it's no longer me who lives, but Christ who lives me in the life I now live. I live by the Son of God who loves me and died for me, right? That's an identity scripture. And I sow that in me. So I sow it over and over. And I meditate on this word. So I'm putting the seed into my heart, into my soul, soil of my heart. And then when life comes at me and says, hey, this is not who you are. You aren't worthy here. You can't do this. I can grab that fruit that has been sown in my heart. No, God says, it's no longer me. I've been crucified in Christ. It's, it's he that lives in me, right? And so this becomes uh, food and harvest inside of my heart. And so that's probably why I love Mark the most because it teaches me kingdom living through kingdom miracles.
for me, Mark uh, really emphasizes faith. Uh, you see in Mark eleven twenty four, you know, a major power of faith scripture. Um, and Mark 4, in Jesus' parables about the seed, he, he, um, he really emphasizes the, the importance of faith, the power of faith, and um, kind of reveals sort of uh, the nature of faith. And so that's something about Mark that I really love. Mark is a beautiful, beautiful book to read if you really want to learn about the compassion, the mercies, and the miracles that Jesus worked. Because there's a place when we read the Gospel of Mark and we discover the faith that Jesus walked in, that he walked with the Holy Spirit and he moved in power and signs, that that is your calling too. And you don't know what your authority is or your calling if you're not in the Word because the Word reveals truth. He says, I discern truth. This is Jesus speaking this. He says, I discern truth. He's telling his disciples this. And if we have the mind of Christ, which the scripture speaks and tells us that we have the mind of Christ, then we discern truth. So that means when all of the world is coming against you with deception or the news or culture or the way that you've you've grown up, and then you dive into the scripture and you read these miracles of Mark, then you can walk into a place and you can say, I discern truth because I have the mind of Christ and this is not right. Because Mark tells these stories and how God moved in these signs and wonders. And I don't have to walk in hopelessness and despair because I can see that scripture and all of these miracles that Mark has, has told us about. So we're so grateful for the book of Mark because it, it presents Jesus in this heavenly realm that walks as a harmless dove, yet he's holy and he's powerful and he loves people and he is for us to walk in abundance with the signs and the miracles. As you know, later on, Mark uh, traveled with the Apostle Paul and Silas, or Barnabas. Barnabas and Mark were first cousins. And uh, when they got to Pamphylia up in Turkey, uh, Mark became homesick and turned around and went back. And so Paul, on the second missionary journey, when Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, uh, Paul got so upset that he would not allow Mark to come. Paul had not yet learned forgiveness, apparently. This is Mark 14. Now I'm reading out the Passion Translation. There was a young man there that was following Jesus, wearing only a linen sheet, sheet wrapped around him. They tried to arrest him also, but he slipped from their grasp and ran off naked, leaving his linen cloth in their hands. Alright, I'm going to ask you to speculate a little bit, Katie. Who do you think that was? Uh, I have no idea who this may be. I'm believing that it was probably a teenager that was following the crowd. I really don't know and I have dug so much on that and I can't find a definitive answer, but if I just had to, just had to throw a name out there, I would probably say John. I have no idea. I have no idea who that might be. And uh, didn't he even leave that and take off naked the rest of the way? Yeah, that's strange that that's in there. I mean, there are some things. There's one, it's wonderful that the Bible, the four gospels, all of it, uh, you can have a really deep understanding by spending your time with God. But there's some things we're not going to know. And that why that was put in there. And... Uh, and so far, I've never known, you know. I've heard it taught and heard it said that that is the rich young ruler who Jesus addressed and said, if you want to enter the kingdom and your heart is truly to enter the kingdom, what you're going to need to do is sell everything and then you can enter the kingdom. And so I've heard it said that maybe he took it very literally, sold everything down to his underwear and, uh, and that's who that was. I think it is John Mark. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's the author. I think he's referring to himself. And it doesn't really say it's Mark, but I think it is. Uh, it's a picture of him getting up in the middle of the night during the uh, trial of Jesus and wrapping a sheet around him and going out and then somebody grabbed the sheet and pulled it off of him and he fled away naked. 
Uh, that may be Mark. The young man thought to be Mark. Wait a minute, traditionally, I'm reading the footnotes. This young man was thought to be Mark, the author of this gospel. Mark may be using this common literary device as an illusion of speaking of himself, which would mean that the young man was a teenager in his early 20s. This linen sheet. Oh my God, this is so fun. I don't think I knew that. Picking up a cross. They put a winner on the cross. Pick it up, pick it up. So let me hear you say Jesus. Well, Luke is interesting because he writes a, a double gospel message. So when we take Luke and Acts together, you get the whole picture of the early church. So uh, we have the life and ministry of Jesus and then the unfolding of the early church after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So Luke is unique in that he's probably the more of a trained writer, a trained historian, whereas the others were, as the Bible says, they're, they're Galileans, they're uneducated. And so they're writing and then they probably have help in editing it and cleaning it up and getting it into its final form. Whereas as Luke is a, very much of a wordsmith. Luke the physician, compassion. You know, to be a physician, you have to be a compassionate person. You have, you have to really care about people's feelings and their emotions and you have to be able to really dig deep. You have to be able to to pull that out of people. Luke was the physician, just like Jesus is the great physician. He helps us to understand the compassionate side of Jesus, the side of Jesus that has mercy, the side of Jesus that has grace. Luke, he mostly, he's a Gentile, so he mostly focuses on the Gentiles in his book that he writes. Luke was very, like Luke was a, was a physician, had the great bedside manner, but also was a historian. Um, was actually named by atheists. So some atheists said that he was actually one of the greatest historians of the ancient world. And that coming from, from atheists is a, is a pretty great mark um, for Luke. A matter of fact, uh, um, archaeologist William Ramsey uh, wrote that he was he was skeptical of Luke's historical accuracy to begin with whenever he began some of his archaeological finds, but the more that he dug, the more that he was convinced that Luke was more than your typical historian and gave more credence, credence to the way that he wrote. So even, even atheists look at Luke and know that there is historical accuracy in that. Luke was written in the late 80s, 60s, twos, anywhere between 70 and 85. And Luke told the humanity of Jesus. He tells the, the humanistic form of Jesus. Jesus was 100% human and he was 100% God. He's very thorough, he's, he's detailed. He, he, he likes to bring in uh, times and places and, and he's descriptive. Dr. Luke, the physician, um, he, was, uh, he was specifically writing to uh, an influential Gentile, uh, trying to help him understand who Christ was, the Messiah. Uh, so his, his point of view was definitely to the Gentiles. Luke has 24 chapters. Quite, uh, quite detailed, and we know that there are parables included there that are not in the other Gospels. And then I would say Luke, uh, the Jews would call Luke a Gemara, which means complete. Uh, Luke is much more complete. He begins with the life, uh, the genealogy of Jesus and the life of John the Baptist, uh, his birth, uh, the context around uh, the, the birth of Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, it's an amazing story that Luke alone has. Based off of that, Luke used a lot of this source material from, from Mark and Matthew and did a lot of research in finding his. So his is going to mimic some of what they found, but Luke's is the longest because he was using the other source material and gathering the information from, from others. 
to write his gospel. So he went into further detail that maybe Mark didn't go into detail in his gospel with, but when Luke was talking with him, gathered more information on the topic. He endeavors to write the most uh, chronological account. He's writing to his friend Theophilus, who he addresses both in Luke uh, and in Acts. And he gave us two books. He gave us the, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Both are historical. And the word Gemara means complete. And so Luke has probably 36 or so uh, of Jesus' miracles and also about 36 or so of his parables. And uh, so there was a lot of teaching in Luke. And Luke was a doctor, so his vocabulary is bigger than Mark's gospel and uh, not as simple to read. Uh, he also has some unique appearances of Jesus after the resurrection of Jesus. He put together a bunch of information for somebody named Theophilus. Now, um, that's the Theophilus name you've ever heard. No, I'm kidding. It's, sorry. Um, Theophilus was, it, it means lover of God in Greek. And so, uh, or, or, or someone with brotherly love for God. And so Theophilus could have been a, a dude that Mark, I mean, that Luke was um, putting together the information for. So either Luke was, was writing his book for someone named Theophilus, or it may have been simply for the generic Christian or a group of Christians, because Christians are lovers of God. Uh, this guy who was not one of the disciples, so it's not a testimony of one of the people who uh, walked with Jesus, but seemed to be a commissioned project where Luke, who was a doctor, very intelligent, educated, set out to be the one who would gather a historical record of not only the life of Jesus, but the beginnings of the church afterwards. So we have Luke and Acts, both written to this guy, Theophilus, who probably funded Luke's work, to tell the story of uh, the assurance that people would have when they believe that the, the gospel was true, that all of this account of Jesus, all the eyewitnesses he spoke to, all of the writings that he would gather, compiling all of those things up to make a thorough account. This is 25% of the New Testament is in these two books of the testimony of all of the people that we have in Luke. In Luke chapter 1, there's a, there's a, a way that Luke writes, and the King James uh, uses the words or the term or the phrase kind of uh, uh, Luke is saying, these things I'm, I'm kind of putting out there for you guys, and these are the things that are most surely believed. And so he uses this, like, he just grabs you from the beginning saying, these are the things that many have taken in hand to write these accounts down, these things that, you know, he's addressing Theophilus, you know, uh, the, what I believe is he's saying the children of God. He says, these are the things that you've heard that are surely believed, these stories, these instances, these, these moments with Jesus when he was here on the earth. And so uh, that's what I love about Luke. Is he tells stories with women. This is one of the gospels that he includes women in many of his stories. It's usually, it's a man's, a story of a man and then a woman, a man and then a woman. And so you're getting different perspectives. He, he talks more about women than, um, than Matthew, Mark, or John do um, as far as their role in Jesus' ministry and, um, and just Jesus' interactions with them. Also in Luke um, is the story of the woman who came to the banquet that Simon gave. And if you use your imagination and pretend to be there, you can't hardly stay dry-eyed because the story itself is amazing that something had happened to her in her uh, relationship with Jesus that she was so grateful and so humble that she would come and wash his feet with the tears of her eyes and dry them with her hair. I wonder what people would think if they would see something like that today. But you know, uh, that Pharisee, F Simon, had been healed of leprosy. And so we find that he's thinking in his heart, if this man knew what manner of woman it is that's touching him, he, he wouldn't allow it because she... If this man was a true prophet, that's what he said, then he would know what type of woman is touching him, for she is a sinner. You see, he's not going to claim to be one. 
So Jesus had to tell a little parable about two men that owned the same other man, certain amount of money. One was significant and one was very little, but neither could pay. And so Jesus told the, that, uh, that the uh, debtor uh, allowed both of them just to go free of their debt. And he asked the question, which one of them is going to love their master the most? And so Simon said, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. And so he, he revealed Jesus' secret there in the parable because Jesus said, you've answered correctly. You see her, she's loved much and her sins are forgiven. And some people believe, even though it's not written, that uh, Simon probably gave his heart fully to the Lord that night too. So he goes from the Roman centurion to the woman of Nain. So if you're reading the story, you see his pattern. He's saying there's a man's story and the human woman's story. And so it's encouraging because this gospel has more stories of women than any of the other gospels. So I can get excited about as a woman. I'm like, yes, we're, we're equal in the story of in God's eyes where he's teaching the importance and the value of each gender and how we play a role with the King of Kings. And Luke is also uh, like, he, it's the one where it says that Jesus touched a leper, if I recall correctly. And I love that because Jesus could have healed him with a word. Like that, he did that in the past, right? He would, he would heal with a word or he would heal with a touch um, or he would spit in the mud, you know, make, make stuff and put on people's eyes to heal a blind person. But with this leper, he reaches out and he puts his hand on him. And according to the law, that should have made Jesus unclean, but it doesn't. It makes the leper clean. And I think that's so cool. Uh, in chapter 18, we find the story of the rich young ruler. Well, that's not the only place it's, uh, not the only place that it's recorded. But you'll remember what happened as man came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus told him, uh, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And he gave him my invitation that day to leave the worries of trying to maintain your wealth and all that stuff behind and just go with Jesus. And to say he went away sorrowfully because he had great possessions. And so Jesus made the statement, how hardly is it for a rich man to enter heaven? It's easier for a, a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Astonished the disciples because they also was of the mindset at the time that if you were wealthy and you were well, God was showing his favor on you because you were such a great person. And uh, if you were sick or, or poverty stricken, you had to be a sinner, you know. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 21 times in Luke about the Holy Spirit will come upon you with power and signs and wonders. The Holy Spirit will move through you. The Holy Spirit is your counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby. So Luke in, in explains how the Holy Spirit helps us how when Jesus was on earth, how he was led by the Holy Spirit, how he did nothing without the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit um, was his partner with him on this earth when Jesus was in flesh. These men paid with their lives for the information they were given, because think about it. All they had to do when they came up and threatened to kill them is, was to renounce Christ. If Luke had thought, just like the rest of them, if he thought this was just a, a, a ruse or a, a fraud, they wouldn't have died for it. Wouldn't have been tortured for it. Wouldn't have lost everything they owned for it. Luke just has, Luke has a lot of uh, unique parables. It does have an interesting story. It's the only one that talks about the funeral beer that's going by and Jesus is walking along. He sees this funeral beer and, and the coffin's being carried by some dudes and, and the, guys, the, the dead guy's uh, mom is there and she's also a widow and she's just broken up and Jesus comes over and he puts his hand on the coffin, everybody just stops, you know? And Jesus says, you know, get up. And the young man gets up, and he says, it says Jesus gave him back to his mother, which is just like he just presented. And, and it's weird that that's, that's a resurrection story to some extent, and it's only in Luke, just like the resurrection of Lazarus is only in John.
And then kind of off doing his own thing is the book of John. Uh, we have John probably written much later than the other ones. John the Apostle, John whom Jesus loved, in the midst of his imprisonment, writing this account of the life of Christ, a very theological masterpiece, really focusing in on what God was doing 
in the life of Jesus. Some of this probably has to do with perspective. John was putting together this story, and as they got a little bit older, they began to see the value of writing this down in case they weren't going to be around and others would have the benefit of their testimony. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are drawing from a common source. And so we can see sayings in each one of those Gospels that are common to each other. John, however, takes a completely different course. He doesn't begin his Gospel with a genealogy or with a nativity story. He starts with in the beginning. So he starts with this cosmology, hearkening back to Genesis. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then in verse 14, the Word or the Lagos of God, it, it was made flesh and it came and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That's very different from what we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So John is starting out with this cosmological idea that God through Christ is recreating the world just as he formed it in the first place in the creation act in Genesis. And then Luke talks about shepherds coming and, uh, you know, the angels coming to the shepherds, the lowest of the low, and them coming and worshiping Jesus and uh, going out and telling everybody about it. But Mar uh, John doesn't speak that way about the birth of Jesus. He uses symbol and image. Uh, he talks about Jesus being the light that enlightens everyone. Uh, he talks about Jesus being the light that uh, could not be taken down by the darkness. It's an interesting word, katalambano. The Greek word means to out-wrestle or to take somebody down. Uh, the light, the darkness can never take down the light. It can't comprehend it, it can't over, overcome it, it can't understand it. Uh, and so Jesus is the light that comes into the world, according to John 1, 9. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God from the beginning, verse 2. Verse 3, all things were made, they were made through Him, and nothing was made that wasn't made by Him. And then John 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He's talking about Jesus Christ right off the bat. Christ is God. John apparently uh, saw that they left out a lot of things, and he um, brought very interesting stories that the others left out. The first three we call synoptic gospels because they're very similar, and they spend a lot of time, uh, a, a lot of time talking about. Christ's death on the cross and, and those last days on earth. Um, John focuses on the deity of Christ, of Jesus, uh, fully God, fully man. He's the Logos, he's the Word. Uh, and he brought out stories that uh, would back that up, uh, his miracles, his divinity. And uh, it's a very strong theological work, body of work. And then John 1, 14, he is the word of the Father who comes into the world and becomes flesh. And I think it was Tertullian that first asked the question in the third century, when the word became flesh, did it stop being the word? But I think the answer to that is pretty clear. No, it did not. So John is uh, based on seven miracles in the life of Jesus. The whole book of John is the number seven. And it's similar to Revelation, where he has seven visions. And the number seven is mentioned over 50 times in the book of Revelation. So John is high level. Uh, and yet, when I taught Greek, I, I was able to uh, get my students to read the Gospel of John first, because it's so simple. I had them memorize parts of John, because it's so easy to remember. My favorite gospel is the book of John because it tells the salvation message. In John 3, 16, it says it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John was all about spreading the love of Christ and the salvation of Jesus. And what you see in the gospel of John is unlike about 90% of the rest of the Gospels, 
And he portrays Jesus as God, as the Son of God. You have the seven I am's uh, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am, you know, uh, the light of the world. And, and so he is portrayed as God. Um, the, the key words in, in John are, are believe and eternal life. Of course, the verse that just almost everyone can co quote from the Gospel of John 3.16 is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For example, John writes with a very high Christology, and we follow this all throughout where he uses the ego eime statements of Jesus, alluding back to Exodus 3.14, where Jesus is claiming divinity throughout, and John makes sure to present that. The, the gospel of love. I'm telling you, if you could go back and read John, read it with the lens of encountering Jesus's love. You know, John is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I love this because, listen, this is something we can say too. It's not that Jesus loved the other ones less and he loved John the most. It was John just recognized his identity. He said, I'm the one that Jesus, is lo that Jesus loves. I'm his beloved. And that's something that you can say. I'm the one that Jesus loves. I'm his beloved. All of us can say this. So, so John understood his identity in Jesus. And this is so important because as you're reading it, this book really describes your identity. If you have this question like, who am I? Why, why, what is my purpose? Why am I born? John. John is the gospel to dive into and say, you know what, I'm going to study my identity. My identity here is I'm the one who Jesus loves. I'm the one who gives him bliss. I'm the one that walks in his favor. Do you see how I'm saying this? You can say this with boldness and with declaring because the word says this over you. It's so important when you're reading the scriptures to say, you know, he said this to his disciples. This was his first 12 disciples. But you, if you are following the word or his disciples, this word is for you. So when you're reading John, it's important to discover, I'm going to get my identity. I'm going to know my authority so that I can walk in the love of Jesus. We've talked about earlier that John seemed to want the reader to know uh, that God is love, that Jesus is God. And uh, that's a pretty big statement, God is love. He's not the one who invented it or found it, but he is love. John had closer dealings in some ways than even some of the other 12, at least he thought so. Um, and John's, John also, they believe, is one of the last of the four gospels that was written. And he wrote it not in a chronological order of events, but more of the telling of the story of. stuff. But John is the deepest. And I like John, uh, even though he uses, even in Greek, there's smaller words. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's just very, very broad and, and deep, the way that he writes. And uh, John is also very personal. Uh, when he writes his gospel, he's, he says things like, uh, I'm writing this to you in order that you may believe. And uh, then, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, John has a unique appeal. And John is putting out this view of Christ, which is a very exalted Christology of the, the deity of Jesus Christ from chapter 1, where the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, or tabernacles among us, through all the ego amis statements. And so I think this is something that both Jew and Gentile would be able to grasp. Like Luke has tons and tons of, of, of parables. John has specific miracles that aren't in all the others. You know, um, Luke has like the, the prodigal son and the, the, the tree with the fertilizer. I love that story. He's like, you know, don't, don't cut down the tree yet. Let me put some fertilizer mm -hmm, on it and that'll help it grow. That'll preach, by the way. Um, but, but John is like the story of the death of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, the man born blind. I love that passage. Uh, the guy at the pool of Bethsaida. John has a brother, James. The, their father's name is Zebedee. And their mother is 
sort of trying to manage their ministry expectations. So she's always trying to mitigate on their behalf with Jesus. Uh, when you enter your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your left and the other sit on your right? Uh, John is the youngest of the, of the disciples. And when on Easter morning, when Peter and John both take off running, John beats Peter to the grave. Um, and so we know that he, he's younger. He has a, maybe a fresher, different perspective than some of the others might have. But it's John who has this powerful transformational experience. And Jesus must have really seen something in John because when he's pulling the inner circle together, it's Peter, James, and John, like at the Mount of Transfiguration. Then there's times where he's got all 12. Then there's times there's the 70. Then there's the 120. There's the 500. And then there's the 5,000 and the multitudes beyond that. But when it's <clears throat> really getting into that inner circle, John was part of that. And so no one knew Jesus better than John. And even at the Last Supper, this may have been John who was leaning on Jesus or reclining next to him at the Last Supper. It doesn't say me, it says the one Jesus loved, but we all know he's talking about himself. And it, and it goes even further in John 20, verses 3 through 8, where they're running to, to the empty tomb. And he just has to point this out, that it was him and Peter that was running to the tomb. But the other disciple got there first. <laughs> So Peter, Peter and John had this, had this back and forth, and you got to understand who, who they were even before they were called. So you've got Peter, the rock, right? And Peter is this very strong-willed, very, very manly man type of, of character that sometimes because of his, because of his bullheadedness, because of his, his, his eagerness to go and do things and be the be the the big strong guy sometimes he got himself in trouble with that I identify with Peter a lot um, and then you've got John John was also called it was one of the sons of thunder so between the two of them the two of them are just have this attitude of no I'm bigger I'm better no I'm bigger I'm better and, and and they went back and forth and if I really had to had to guess whenever Jesus came in and the disciples were arguing over which one was the best I would put money on if I was a betting man, I would put money on that it was between Peter and John. John is a whole different level. John had another generation to think about all the things that Jesus did and taught. John was more of a mystic and uh, certainly a prophet since he wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, John uh, has different insight. And so I would, I would call John like a Zohar, uh, probably the most, the best known statement from the Zohar is silence is golden. But uh, the rest of the quote is except in study of Torah or except in study of Talmud, depending on which uh, rabbi you read. And so silence is golden. But, but John uses uh, a depth that the others don't use. One of the coolest things about John, though, is, is all like Matthew and Mark and Luke all talk about the upper room, but they don't give the in-depth conversation of Jesus with the disciples like John does. John from like chapter 13, he talks about washing their feet. And then the next two and a half chapters is just this back and forth between Jesus and the disciples. And, and then also in Acts, I mean, excuse me, in John 17, uh, in John 17, Jesus gives the high priestly prayer and he prays for us. Like, I don't know if you always pick up on that when you read it, but he, he prays for all who will believe because of the message of the disciples, and that's us. So Jesus in Scripture prays for us. That's really personal. Ephesus had all these manuscripts, so John was there. He may well have read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, copies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, you know, we don't have any of those originals. Uh, there may be a scrap or two of originals that are left but we don't have any full manuscripts of any originals that go back past the end of the second century, which is really interesting that God didn't see fit to save the original manuscripts. That John uh, included stories that were included in the Synoptic Gospels because uh, he read them and left, uh, he thought they left out some important information. and, and some information that would benefit what he was trying to, the message he was trying to give out, which is the divinity of Jesus. Uh, so 
he showed a lot of different uh, the compassion of Jesus. He showed the uh, the miracles and works of Jesus. He showed a whole other side of Jesus uh, that the Synoptic Gospels didn't show. Then he said, you know, uh, there's no sense in me retelling what they've already told. So I'm going to tell some stories that they didn't tell. You know, water into wine. Uh, you know, the woman at the well. Some of these stories that you don't see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I think that was just him saying. And then he even at the at the end of his his writing, he says. You know, there's so many stories written. There's so many other things written. If we were to try to write them all down, the world couldn't contain all of the books that, that, that would be written. So I think to me that's evidence that he knew what was in the other books. He knew what Matthew, Mark, and Luke had written. And he said, hey, I'm just going to write some different things. The woman at the well is the first woman evangelist. She is the story of, of someone who was an outcast, who was put away, that Jesus said, hey, I know you, I care about you, and I've called you. And when she encounters the king and she discovers truth, that he's the living water, then she goes out and tells an entire city, hey, come and look and see, I've met the Messiah. Do you understand? It's someone that encountered the king who told her everything about her. And she said, I'm in, I'm in. So he sat on Jacob's well to meet the woman at the well. Jacob's well was water that they would go to all the time. They would constantly be thirsty and they would have to draw the water up. He sat on the well because he is the living well. He told her, come to me and you will thirst no more because I give you a drink that this water, this actual water can't give you. And that's Jesus. He's the word and he's the drink. He's what we need. So even though in our flesh we need food and water, our spirits need the food and the water of the word because that's what fills us. And that's what John is telling this story is not only did she need Jesus, but Jesus wanted her. He was hurt his drink too. And that's the way Jesus feels about you is that he desires you and you fulfill him as much as he fulfills you. And John is the one that concludes the entire book by saying, and guess what? I suppose that the entire world itself could not contain all of the books that would be written if everything that Jesus did was written down. And so he admits as, as many of us have tried, we could never fully describe to you who Jesus really is, uh, although they do a, a very good job in, in doing so. You know, the Gospels, uh, no matter which author, have the ability to get us to know Jesus better and, and it starts to melt the heart because you just can't hardly get through a whole one without it's, this Holy Spirit being there to guide and starting to convict you and uh, they're wonderful. Like I say, I've spent almost an entire calendar year on Saturdays preaching from the four Gospels answering that question, uh, how do we love God? It, it's so personal. Read the book of John, learn to love Jesus again because the more that you learn about him, the more that you, you love him. You know, when you, when you see all this, all this truth and all that he did for the sake of us, you, you can't help it. You know, if, if, if you've been renewed, you, you can't help but love him when you read that. And then I would also tell people, and after you finish John, uh, read the book of First John, because that one has kind of uh, like almost a dozen litmus tests that are like, if you belong to Christ, this is what you're going to look like. And you're not going to you know, fit that perfectly, but it's a way for you to kind of say, okay, where do I go from here? What, what behaviors and what thought patterns and attitudes should my life be showing if I belong to Christ? And then those things, uh, the Holy Spirit brings them out of you as you learn what God wants. And uh, so I would say read the book of John and then 1 John. And so when the Holy Spirit would give them the information, they had the facts, they had the remembrance, and they were able to put it down as they saw it. So therefore to show proof. 
If you look in John 14, 26, it says, don't, he said to the apostles, he said, don't worry about what you, what, what, what you saw and trying to remember. He said, the Holy Spirit, he will bring back to your mind, to your conscious memory, all the things that Jesus said. So therefore, they didn't have to remember, didn't have to have a perfect memory because God himself gave it to them and then told them what to write. That's how we know that from Genesis to Revelation, the same Holy Spirit is controlling the Word. Uh, I'm going to make a statement, and I wish I was the one that came up with this, but I'm not, I'm not going to claim that um, what I'm about to say that I came up with. I wish I had. We're spiritual beings having an earthly experience to accomplish the will of the Father in the earthly realm. It's only possible through our relationship that came with the Father that comes through Jesus Christ. There's no way we get to the Father but through Jesus. He's the authority that we walk in. God is the power that we exercise and, and exercise in the world system. So if you're not experiencing what Jesus said in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, you need to back up slow down and you need to engage Jesus in a very personal intimate way and come into an intimate relationship it's all about relationship the the Lord just told me not to charge for the coffee and it's interesting to watch people's face they come in to get an espresso or regular coffee and we they they want to how much is it and we tell them well, it, we don't charge for it. Well, how are you going to stay in business? How are you going to pay your bills if you don't charge for the coffee? Well, that's not our problem because God's the owner and Jesus Christ is CEO. If I can't pay the bills, I'll lock the door and go home because it all belongs to God. None of it belongs to me. Well, read it with an open heart, with an open mind. Um, be careful. It can be addictive. I know when I began to read the Bible, I just, I, I got drawn into it. It's all that I wanted to do was to read these stories. And then just like the questions you've been asking me, the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I was asking myself those same questions. So I believe he said this in Luke or he said this in Matthew, and I was wanting to, to cross-reference them. Uh, so I would encourage someone to do that. Uh, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as they hear God's word, then I think their faith will grow and maybe their perspective of God will change also where we have a, a really big God who's able to do big things. This is the greatest advice ever. Jesus loves you. This is what I would say. And he said, listen, all who cry out to me, if you call out my name, if you confess that I am Lord, I will be there. I will be your Lord and Savior. He said, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory. When you confess your um, sins and you confess that I am your Lord, I will come in and live with you and I will be your teacher and Savior and Lord and I will be the one that you need and I am the creator so I will show you everything and all you have to do is say Lord come into my life I, I believe you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose three days. And I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And then he is your Lord and Savior. It is that simple. It's confessing with our mouth and believing with our heart. And by faith that Jesus is your king. You know what time it is. Come on now. Let's get it. I said I'm ten toes down for the Lord Go and put on your arm and I go and pick up your sword We about to go to war, kicking the devil's door Tell Satan to get his hands up, now get down on the floor We don't believe them lies or anything that he said Jesus brought us back to life, he resurrected the dead The soldier for the Christ, tell me how you gonna win If Jesus conquered the grave and vindicated our sin As long as we repent, we know that you had a loss Everything you represent is just a lie and it is false So God when this sin is only something to pay Yes, we was out.
out and we was labeled some black sheep. Now it's ten toes for the Lord. Tell the devil, take a back seat. Hush, girl. Pull up on him, it's his blood. It was shed. Red dots everywhere. Bust a demon in his head. 66 and holy tipping, fully automatic Bible. We go blocka, blocka, blocka. We don't worship worldly idols. Devil lie, he a punk. You can tell him Slade said it. Resurrected by my savior. Now I'm headed off the heaven. We do it for Jesus, cause he freed us. We got the armor on the enemy, can't defeat us. We soldiered up for the Lord and we on the front lines. And I go stupid on the beach, you know I got the punchlines. Hey, they hung the winner on the cross. So I'm picking up my cross. They put a winner on the cross, P.